And good morning. I'm Donna Zarconi, President and CEO of the Economic Club of Chicago. And I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Peter Orzag, CEO of Financial Advisory at Lazard. And I'm happy to be joined by fellow Economic Club of Chicago member, Peter Thompson, who's Managing Director and Chairman, Midwest Advisory of Lazard. Thank you both for being with us today. We'd also like to welcome the members attending from the Economic Clubs of New York and Washington, DC. Delighted that you can join us. I'll start our program with brief introductions, followed by a moderated conversation between Peter Orzak and Peter Thompson. And we will also be accepting live questions from the audience during this program. So please submit any questions that you may have using the Q&A tab in Zoom. Please note the conversation is being recorded and we plan to post the content for general access on our YouTube channel after the program. So now it is my pleasure to formally introduce our moderator and our guest speaker. Our moderator today is Peter Thompson, Managing Director and Chairman of the Midwest Financial Advisory Team at Lazard. And Peter has over 25 years of experience in the financial services industry and is an active civic leader in Chicago. He's a longstanding economic club member and serves on our program committee. And thank you for joining us, Pete. Thanks, Dan. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's special guest speaker, Dr. Peter Orzag. Peter currently serves as CEO of Financial Advisory at Lazard, leading the firm's business that advises companies and governments across the globe. He served as director of the Office of Management and Budget under the Obama administration. And prior to that, he was director of the Congressional Budget Office from January 2007 to December 2008. I might add that it's very rare to have served in both roles, so quite impressive. He's an alum of Princeton and he holds his PhD in economics from the London School of Economics. So with his expertise in economics and his experience in the healthcare industry, we are looking forward to hearing his insights on the current healthcare crisis with this pandemic and what the pathway to recovery may be. So thank you again for joining us. Now, Pete, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Donna. Uh, I just wanna say also on behalf of our 3000 or so colleagues at Lazard and our 87 colleagues in Chicago, I wanna thank you particularly for the opportunity to be here today. I do think locally it's worth noting that in addition to our investment banking and advisory presence in town, uh, that our global head of liability management and restructuring, David Kurtz, is a Chicagoan. He's actually based in town with about half the team. I think many of you know also our private equity business, the Edgewater Funds, which is based in Chicago and led by Jim Gordon, a long, long time economic club member and a real business and philanthropic leader in Chicago. So a special thanks to you on behalf of our, our local team. And a special thanks to Deb Cafaro, the entire board, the Economic Club, and the staff for all the great work you've always done, but particularly during this uh, period of, of great crisis. And again, thank you to the New York and DC Economic Clubs for joining us today. And now on to Peter. Um, it, it is worth noting that Peter expressly, despite the fact we work together, Peter expressly requested to not see or be tipped off on any of the forthcoming questions. So there's no inside baseball here. We're gonna roll straight into them. And as Donna mentioned, in doing so, we're gonna kind of cover the bu buckets of your career, Peter, both as an economist, a healthcare economist, a policymaker, uh, an investment banker, and, and CEO. So, so in saying that, you know, kind of on the heels of the most recent employment report and continued and maybe even increasing confusion and uncertainty, where are we now from a healthcare and an economic perspective? Well, uh, thank you for, uh having me and Peter, thank you for uh, serving as moderator. Uh, where we are is in the uh, midst of obviously a very substantial public health crisis and an economic crisis also. So I think a reasonable estimate is that for every period of time in which we have broad social distancing in place, that is uh, efforts to uh, make sure that most businesses are that are not essential are not operating and people are at home, that there's something like a 30% of GDP loss for each of those periods. So that's obviously a really big um, economic shock. We have had policy come in to try to blunt the damage from that um, for the period that we've been living through. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about the CARES Act and some of the backlash that is likely to build over time 
um, when it proves like all pieces of legislation to be imperfect. Um, but I think the bigger challenge is what lies ahead as we ease up on some of the social distancing. Uh, it looks like uh, an effective therapeutic or antiviral, and by effective, I mean effective enough that we would no longer have to fear um, getting the disease, that that is not likely to, to be uh, present for um, some significant period of time. And so we are likely to be cycling through um, episodes of broad social distancing coming on, coming off, going back on again. And every time we do that, there is yet more economic distress. And one of the, one of the challenges here is there is a big Humpty Dumpty type effect where uh, you go through something that severe, unemployment rises, bankruptcies uh, occur, and even when the problem, the underlying health, public health problem uh, disappears or dissipates, the economy does not come back um, immediately. And so uh, I think there are many things that we can be looking forward to in a positive way, but we have to understand also the depth of both the public health and economic challenges that we're facing. Got it. Well, well speak, speaking then of social distancing, um, here we are in Chicago today, 60 degrees is probably the warmest day we've had in, in a few weeks. And, and presumably the combination of you know, the duration of the quarantine so far and warming weather uh, has brought a heightened desire uh, to get outside and to loosen restrictions uh, in many cases. And, and locally, I think you know, you've seen this, locally, Governor Pritzker and Mayor Lightfoot uh, have, in my opinion, rightfully earned kind of national acclaim for for taking the other side of that and being a little bit more stringent on on trying to flatten the curve. And in fact, in Chicago, we know that if you cross that line ever so slightly, you look over your shoulder, Mayor Lightfoot is there to send you back home. So what are your thoughts on loosening restrictions right now? Well, a few things. One is we're likely to see significantly different reactions and different responses across different parts of the country. And one of the challenges that will then ensue is uh, what do you do with um, different areas of the country that are relaxing social distancing at different, uh, at different rates? I mean, Georgia being a clear example, combined with the potential for people to move from one area of the country to another, because it doesn't work to have very substantial um, social distancing measures in place in one part of the country, not in another, and then allow people to move back and forth between the two parts. So are we going to be um, moving towards more restrictions on uh, people uh, moving or driving across uh, state boundaries? Or are we going to be moving towards more uniform uh, approaches, even though it's ultimately up to the discretion of uh, governors and in some cases mayors? Um, with regard to the degree of social distancing, but what, what won't work is to have vastly different approaches, vastly different rules, and then have people moving from one part of the country to another because it will defeat the purpose of the stricter social distancing in some areas to allow people who may be um, asymptomatic with the disease coming in from areas that uh, had looser social distancing um, restrictions in place. So, so you do have this, you know, large and, and seemingly growing group of people that, that are pushing for loosening of restrictions. And, and, and in many cases, they point to Sweden and they point to Sweden's approach to, to COVID-19, imposing far fewer restrictions, you know, than just about anybody anywhere. Um, and there are some reports out there, and I know that, that they're challenged uh, by others, uh, that show herd immunity in Sweden by kind of mid-May or something like that. It, it, is this, is this supporting evidence for loosening um, restrictions or is it kind of apples and oranges? I think it's a little bit of apples and oranges. I mean, the thing we have to realize is Swedes kind of do social distancing even when they're not told to, to socially distance. So there was a great uh, cartoon that I saw of, of uh, sort of Swedes waiting for a bus before COVID-19 and they were kind of all spaced out, you know, basically six feet apart. And then Swedes waiting for a bus after COVID-19. And again, they're all six feet apart. So uh, the real, the thing that really affects the trajectory of, of this disease is not the government rules that are in place, but the actual practice of whether people are effectively social distancing or not. 
in some in some places you need uh, strict rules to encourage that to happen and others you don't. Sweden is an example where there's a significant amount of social distancing that happens um, even without government dictates. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is they they're they have had a more rapid rise in caseload in in uh, cases than other European countries. So it's going to be very interesting. Let's just take uh, Sweden, which is being held out as one example at one extreme, and let's say Germany uh, at the other, where there's been a much stricter approach in Germany than in Sweden with regard to social distancing, by which I mean from the government. Um, a lot of testing, much different approaches. Uh, I, I, I think it would be uh, vastly premature to conclude that uh, the Swedish model is the more attractive one at this point. The only, the only other thing I'd say is there are other features of Swedish society that make it um, uh, the consequences perhaps different. So the share of people who live by themselves is higher. There's a whole variety of different things that, that could influence um, whether that approach makes uh, more sense or less sense. But um, fundamentally, I think the, the key thing is the degree of social distancing that Swedes do voluntarily almost undoubtedly exceeds what Americans would do voluntarily. Got it, got it. So, so then now let's, let's pivot for a second, you know, kind of rewind to, to your time in Washington. You obviously have unique experience as, as uh, Donna mentioned, um, both serving as director of the Congressional Budget Office, but in this case, more pointedly, um, Office of Management and Budget. Um, you know, and you were there during the financial crisis. So, so maybe give us, give the, the, the club and those watching kind of a picture of what's typically happening day to day in the White House um, in moments like this. And not maybe this particular White House, but maybe more traditionally, although if you do have an understanding about or thoughts about what's occurring in this particular administration day to day, obviously we're open to that. Um, uh, your thoughts on that as well. So what's happening inside any White House in a crisis like this is uh, a very, very dynamic day-to-day -day type of situation where uh, officials are trying to balance really hard decisions with a lot of uncertainty around them, uh, with uh, ongoing need to be uh, interacting with the media and the outside world and sort of making sure that the story is being uh, told with legislative and other uh, inquiries, and with the underlying still operations of the government, um, many of which have to, uh, have to keep going on. And then exacerbating all that in the current situation is the fact that uh, you, have, you have many parts of uh, other governmental en entities that are not functioning uh, in person, but rather uh, virtually. So you put that all together and what people do need to appreciate is these jobs are always hard, but they are almost borderline impossible um, in, in situations like this. I remember that when, when I, I still haven't actually done this in terms of framing it, but um, I, I, I kept a series of my schedule cards from the peak of the crisis. And so, you know, it'd be one printed 10 p.m. the night before, midnight the night before, 6 a.m., 8 a.m., 10 a.m., blah, blah, blah. The only thing that was constant across them was the date because things would move so quickly. And in any White House or in any administration, you have so many incoming um, uh, dynamics that the, your control over your day in order to try to sit down and actually think about what should we do is very limited. So in the current environment, they've got all sorts of implementation issues um, with the CARES Act. So you just saw the Federal Reserve yesterday expand um, one of the CARES Act uh, programs for uh, middle to larger uh, businesses. All sorts of questions about who qualifies, who doesn't, inquiries from senators and members of Congress about why a certain constituent did or did not get um, uh, assistance, planning around a potential additional um, stimulus, what to do about state and local governments. I mean, all these things are swirling around um, at the same time that you're trying to struggle with how do we actually make sure that uh, the food supply is protected, that we've got, we're, we're building up sufficient uh, testing capacity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the challenge is always, how do you um, reserve enough time on your calendar to be giving 
solid thought to some really important decisions. I mean, people should realize uh, we are talking about the Federal Reserve winding up owning maybe between 10 and 20% of corporate debt in the United States. It's a huge share of the economy. And the decisions over include this, don't include that, um, this qualifies, that doesn't qualify, are going to have um, long lasting consequences. And they're often made in a swirl of uh, activity that makes it very difficult to focus. So, so those, those types of decisions, those kind of policy decisions on including, excluding, you know, um, qualifying, unqualifying, the, you know, those obviously have a direct impact on businesses and, and corporate leaders. And, you know, in our business, we spend our days in boardrooms um, talking to boards of directors and company leaders. You, you seemingly do it kind of on the hour uh, these days. And so, so when you're out there talking with CEOs, boards, leaders of government, you know, kind of amidst this crisis, um, you know, is there anything that you experience as kind of a common blind spot for people during this, this period? I would say le over the last week or so, one blind spot has uh, been unblinded. I think, uh, I think you know, a week or two ago, I, my own perception is that the, the view that the, this would be a V-shaped recovery was probably a little bit too prevalent. I, I don't think that that's uh, any longer really the case as people are starting to figure out that even going back to the office is gonna be really complicated, uh, especially in places like where I am now in New York, but uh, also in, in Chicago and other major cities, um, what you do about public transportation, what you do about elevators, what you do about um, sufficient protective equipment for workers and so on, so that it, it, it's not a just snap your fingers uh, back to normal. And I think that is now uh, better appreciated. So that had been um, a bit of a, I don't know if I would call it a blind spot, but a, maybe a, a hope that I think is dissipating a bit. And then look, there's a lot of confusion and um, uh, it, but interest in what all of the medical innovation means. So the, 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 the most salient example may be uh, this Gilead drug, which is one, uh, one approach, it's an antiviral. And by that, I mean, it, what it would allow, what it would sort of hold out the hope of is if you get the disease, uh, that it doesn't spread as rapidly through your body and it helps to kind of contain um, the damage, it, as it were. Um, but there's been all these different news stories and different reports about what it does or doesn't do, et cetera. And so just trying to figure out what does this all mean uh, and what are the implications for when things could uh, start getting back to uh, the way things had been. And then the final piece is, uh, okay, but are we ever gonna get back to the way things uh, had been and how much is going to change? What will be different even when we come out um, on the other side of this? And so maybe one way of putting it is uh, there had been this analogy uh, that what we're going through is like Cape Cod during the winter that, uh, you know, we just shut down for some period of time. Uh, and then you can just the next summer turn everything back on and boom, you're back. Um, and unfortunately, I think there's now a growing appreciation that it's more like Cape Cod during the summer when 20 people were unexpectedly eaten by shark or bitten by sharks. So like Cape Cod during the winter, the place empties out. Unlike Cape Cod during the winter, it was unexpected. And it's not entirely clear exactly when it's safe to go back into the water. And that will happen gradually. Got it. Okay. Well, and, and you know, I, I wanted to, you, you were referencing the, um, that's kind of some of the medical advances. And I, I want to kind of hang on healthcare for a second because we've obviously seen this in Chicago and, it, and it's been the case throughout the country is that um, there's been a kind of a disparity of impact um, that this pandemic has inflicted. And it's pretty clear that greater access to healthcare uh, across all segments of our, our population is definitely needed. Can, can you talk about that and then also um, you know, reference kind of Medicare for all or kind of the push for universal health care um, uh, and think that maybe those uh, ideas are going to get more traction again, kind of get kind of come back to the fore as a result of this. Sure. But let's first just start with what's happening in healthcare because I think people may not fully appreciate that while there is a peak of uh, uh, hospitalizations 
associated with COVID-19, pretty much everything else outside of oncology that is outside of cancer treatments has stopped. And so elective surgeries have gotten some attention, but pretty much everything else that happens in healthcare uh, has come, has been dramatically dialed back. And indeed, um, you mentioned the GDP numbers uh, earlier, uh, half of the decline, half of the fall in GDP during the first quarter came from healthcare because um, the COVID-19 uh, activity, as painful and as uh, challenging as it has been for many hospitals, including here in New York City, has not been a, a uh, dominant force, such a dominant force across the entire country that hospitals are operating at capacity. They are well below capacity now because again, everything else has emptied out. Um, similarly, uh, one of our colleagues, David Pryor is the, at Lazard is also the chair of the National Health Service in the UK. They are operating at about 60% capacity in the National Health Service because of what I just said, which is that uh, uh, elective surgeries and every, every elective procedures, everything else has been um, put aside for the time being. So what that in turn is doing is it's creating a lot of financial pressure on um, physicians' offices, dentists' offices, um, hospitals. There, there is money and there, ha there has been money put into the previous stimulus uh, legislation to help uh, healthcare providers, but um, there are questions about how it's being allocated, how the money's going out the door, and undoubtedly there's going to be more difficulty there. One of the big questions becomes uh, how many of these elective procedures are just delayed versus never happen? And that's important for many healthcare providers. And then on the other side of things, which is where you were going, which is access to healthcare. Let's just go back 10 or 15, 20 years. Um, we've had a growing issue in this country with growing disparities in health outcomes by socioeconomic status. So I think it's now more widely appreciated that while over the past decade, um, life, actually 15 years or so, life expectancy has been going up on average. It's been going up on average because uh, the top has been rising really fast and the bottom has actually been declining. And the average has been going up except for the last couple of years when it actually, the bottom coming down was so powerful that it drove down, it took the entire average down. And that growing, uh, those growing socioeconomic uh, differences in health outcomes are playing through in the current crisis, um, in part because of some underlying conditions. Uh, so the variation in body mass index and underlying diabetes and other things also does vary by some of these indicators. And the disease hits, if you get the disease, the consequences are more uh, troubling if you have some of those uh, kind of risk factors. Um, exactly what we said wouldn't happen just did, apologize about that. I don't know how that snuck through. Um, but there's then also the question of access to healthcare. I'd say uh, we are going to have coming out on the other side of this, a, a major debate over um, healthcare in the United States. I don't think it's gonna lead to Medicare for all. And the reason I don't think it's gonna lead to Medicare for all is the fundamental political economy problem with Medicare for all is that it involves taking health insurance that's provided through employers for 150 million Americans and replacing it with something else. And even if that something else is better, which in many cases it may or may not be, that transition is politically uh, catastrophic. It's really hard to do that. So I am not a believer that we're gonna wind up on the other side of this with anything like Medicare for All. Where I do think we're likely to see uh, movement is uh, where there would already been some traction, um, surprise billing, some additional uh, coverage options uh, and so on. But Again, I think that's on the other side of this. In the meanwhile, we've got significant pressure on many healthcare providers and lots of pressure on state Medicaid and other programs too. So, so the the you know kind of this the situation where elective surgeries are being halted and and then the result is that you've got um, capacity in in many of these hospitals. You know, another you know, potential opportunity or or maybe potential positive outcome for the healthcare system is kind of the the acceleration and the acceptance curve of telehealth and the breakdown of, of you know, some of the regulatory barriers that have kind of held that back. Can you talk both about that as well as any other kind of breakthrough type opportunities in healthcare that you think may we may see as a result of this? 
Well, telehealth is one of many examples. I think it's a, there's similar phenomena in, um, in education where distance learning has been uh, a, a small share of activity and telehealth has been a small share of um, healthcare activity, but it, it, it has massive upside potential. And, and this crisis, especially the longer that we're in it, is likely to spark a lot more um, of that. Some of the questions that arise is, um, how much of the telehealth is going to be powered by artificial intelligence, clinical decision support that can interact with the doctor on the other side of the telehealth? In a sense, how much can become sort of chatbots and automated or uh, human computer assistant uh, for the doctor? Um, mm -hmm. Another question will become the privacy around uh, many of these uh, devices. So you can imagine several years from now that some of the devices that uh, where the voice recognition software has gotten much better and there is video associated with it, that that becomes a very natural way of interacting with first um, some sort of automated, automated chatbot type um, medical uh, data gatherer. And then after that's all put together, uh, you get on the line with a either a nurse or a doctor. Another part of this will be how much your individual health record is already loaded into that discussion and integrated. And so um, there's been movement apart from the coronavirus on making uh, individual health records more accessible and portable. Uh, I think, again, as the world moves to more virtual care, you're going to see more of that uh, activity pick up. Got it. Well, and, and then speaking of kind of assessment and technology, uh, you know, analytics would, would kind of fall into there. Um, you know, from, from your from your time in Washington and, and you've kind of written and, and talked about this often, kind of the need for for advanced analytical um, uh, assessment of federal programs. You know, how, how do you look at the CARES Act or, or the Payroll Protection Act from from that perspective and and kind of assess their effectiveness? recognizing early stage? This is one of my big concerns, which is, as I said earlier, I think it's plausible that we're going to go through additional um, cycles of the disease in which some additional social distancing may be required. And that carries with it the economic challenge that I mentioned in terms of uh, how much economic activity disappears when you're in that period of broad social distancing. So that, that then suggests that we may need additional government assistance in the future to help um, mitigate or attenuate the economic harm from uh, the necessity of social distancing. Here's my concern. The CARES Act was passed. It was a remarkably rapid piece uh, 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 enactment. So in 2009, we mentioned that uh, before, it took about two, two months to enact um, the 2009 stimulus, this was done in a week. And this is uh, two and a half times as large. Um, so a lot of kind of plaudits appropriately for a powerful response. But here's the problem. Um, there's sort of this period right after the legislation is passed where everyone says, yay, we did something, this is great. And then the problems start um, becoming apparent. So we're already seeing some of this. Why did this company even qualify, regardless of whether they took the money, why did they even qualify for that loan? Why did this uh, elite university qualify for assistance again, even if they wound up turning it down? And you're seeing some of that build up. There's gonna be more of that. There will be, I mean, so far we're just talking about entities that um, some people may think are undeserving. There are gonna be entities that are just fraudulent, that don't exist uh, or that were invented that receive money and that will generate backlash. Um, some of the recipients undoubtedly will, will uh, act foolishly and after receiving their federal dollars, go on social media from the mansion or the jet or whatever, um, celebrating that fact, again, generating backlash. At the same time that uh, the unemployment rate remains high and we may need, we may go through one of these other cycles, I'm worried about the wave of backlash that is going to come this summer, hitting at about the same time that an additional round of government assistance may be required. And then the politics of that get very difficult. So, so you know, the the this the safety net is as you're referencing it. There could be some fraud. There could be some people who shouldn't have taken it, taking it. Um, but the federal safe, safety net has been, ex, you know, kind of extended or provided to so many 
businesses. You know, how, how do you think the the debt markets ultimately will respond? Um, you know, will, will we see prepackaged bankruptcy filings as we come out of the crisis? You know, kind of what are your thoughts on on kind of the breadth of this and and then the debt market reaction to it? Well, a couple of things. So first. I mean, kudos to the central banks across the world that uh, by stepping up forcefully, they have induced a significant thawing in corporate debt markets, especially for investment grade debt, but overall. Um, and that would not have happened without very aggressive uh, central bank, including Federal Reserve um, activity. So that's fantastic. Um, I do think that we haven't fully appreciated the fact that, let's just talk about the Federal Reserve as opposed to other central banks, the Federal Reserve is going to be in the middle of a lot of decision making and, um, frankly, political decision making um, that it has shied away from before. So go back to the fact that uh, the Fed may wind up owning 10 to 20 percent of corporate debt in the U.S. as a result of these programs. Well, why these companies and not those companies? Why help these cities and not those cities? And ultimately it can go back to the treasury in, to some degree, but the Fed is more intimately involved in lots of very challenging um, uh, questions about public policy that it really hasn't been involved in before. So that's one piece of uh, the debt markets. Another piece of the debt market is obviously the debate over um, federal debt and whether uh, the run-up in the deficit that is uh, part of these responses is um, a problem or not. It clearly is an experiment. We are running an experiment in whether uh, a significant increase in the deficit creates problems. Um, I believe that experiment is absolutely worth running given, given the damage to the economy that uh, I've been mentioning um, before if we did nothing and the cascading bankruptcies that would result um, if we did nothing but we are still running an experiment. Uh, I personally believe the experiment is gonna turn out okay, but uh, it, you know, we don't have absolutely limitless room to be um, increasing um, public debt. Well, so, so and, and in order to kind of emerge from this and kind of get the economy back on track, as, as you just referenced, you know, we need commerce to be conducted and, and, and certainly in the United States, you know, the consumer is central to that. Right. And so so if the consumer is, is kind of slow to get back into the game, hesitant to spend, um, talk, talk to us a little bit about how you think that impacts things. Well, and obviously we saw the largest reduction in uh, retail spending uh, on record, and that's uh, likely going to be even worse when the April numbers come out. Um, so I think you're right to highlight the consumer. And this is one of the reasons why just declaring that uh, okay, we're back open for uh, business uh, is unlikely to, uh, to actually you know, solve the problem. Um, something like a third of Americans uh, today are, have said that they were, are uncomfortable going to a mall, um, even if it were open, as one example. How many people, even if they were open, would wanna go into a crowded movie theater today or a crowded restaurant or ride on the subway? So this brings me back to um, the, the point I was making earlier about the medical innovation. That problem is solved when we have a vaccine or that problem is solved when we have a very effective ther therapeutic so that you can get the disease and not suffer the consequences for, for it. So literally trillions, tens of trillions of dollars of economic activity um, globally hang in the balance of how rapidly the medical innovation um, occurs because I don't think you can kind of, this is not a fake it till you make it kind of moment. You can't right. just convince consumers that all is fine. It's gotta be the reality that either we have some way of um, uh, uh, protecting people through a vaccine or some way of protecting them through an antiviral or, or therapeutic along with a lot of testing, which um, is another dimension of this that we haven't touched on yet. Got it. Peter, I'm going to jump in here because I just want to do a follow on question, sure. getting uh, several questions being submitted and encourage people to continue to submit via chat. Um, and so one of the questions, just as a follow up to your discussion on the consumer, is that um, for April, the stock market had one of its uh, best months since 1987, I think is the, the correct stats. So why? And yet we saw that, that steep decline in spending. So why is Wall Street 
appearing to be so disconnected from Main Street? Well, there are two pieces to that. If you think about um, the stock market uh, evaluation, one is the sort of the cash flows out into the future. Another is how you're bringing those cash flows back to today, the so-called discount rate. The second piece is obviously, I think uh, there's an expectation of a very low, uh, that interest rates are gonna be super low for a long period of time. I think that's a reasonable expectation. I think the question uh, though uh, persists about um, what about those cash flows and uh, how likely is it that we're going to be seeing a you know, significant return to um, anything like we had experienced before uh, the COVID-19 crisis. That's obviously gonna vary sector by sector. So uh, transportation, hotels, um, some of those types of sectors are more challenging. In healthcare, as we were talking about before, you may actually see um, as the elective surgeries and other procedures are delayed, you may actually see a uh, significant increase uh, as the crisis eases a bit. But I do think there's at least a, behind the question, I think there's a legitimate concern about a potential disconnect between what the equity markets seem to be expecting about the future economic uh, uh, recovery and what might actually occur. So that follows on with another question, which you touched on earlier uh, about the blind spots um, that Pete asked you about the, the V-shaped recovery. If it's not a V, is it a U, is it an L? If we have these cycling throughs, do we perhaps have a W? I like the, I like the Nike swoosh. So it's swoosh. You know, a very steep decline and then a gradual uh, increase with, with some potential um, swiggles along the way. And one thing that people should realize is in the third and fourth quarter of this year, I mean, we may see some massive, like almost or unprecedented growth rates, you know, a million jobs created per month, numbers that are just kind of mind blowing. But that's because we fell so far down the hole in, into a hole that even uh, some increase looks really, really rapid, really, really large. But it's because we, uh, it's a reflection of how far down we went that uh, bouncing back can be can, can come across as a very rapid growth rate. But that, that is you know, a reasonable expectation that as you get past the bottom of the swoosh, that uh, the growth rates will be very, very rapid, even though the levels are still much lower than, uh, than before the crisis hit. So on that same discussion around that, that, what that recovery looks like, um, it, it's going to look quite different or could look quite different for whether you were a um, essential business that kept operating or you were a non-essential business. Uh, and uh, Pete and I were talking about that earlier in terms of our, uh, our uh, the question that came in is, are non-essential businesses dispensable and in fact uh, likely not to come back? And how, do, how, you, how we think about that? Well, it's going to depend on what they were doing. Uh, it, first, first, non-essential business doesn't mean dispensable, and it, this harkens right. back to uh, I, I remember during government shutdowns, the you know the question of whether you're an essential employee and therefore are supposed to report. People almost were offended that they weren't essential and were told that they had to you know they didn't need to come into work. I think similarly here, there are lots of things that are crucially important. Maybe that's the distinction, but that not are not absolutely essential to just the bare minimum of kind of survival, um, which is fundamentally what we're trying to uh, focus on during these periods of broad social distancing. So just on the dispensable part, there are many, many non-essential businesses are not at all uh, dispensable. Now, whether the, there, there are two pieces to this. One is even if demand does come back for whatever uh, the business was providing, does, does the intervening period create, the, as I described, the Humpty Dumpty effect where um, you just can't get over that, that gap? In some sense, that's what a lot of the government programs are trying to do is to bridge to that, uh, that end point. Mm -hmm. um, but the second thing is there, there are undoubtedly lots of businesses that um, will be different in the future than they were before the crisis and may not survive in, in the new environment. Um, and that's partly the flip side of some of the opportunities that we, we were discussing earlier with regard to, for example, increased virtual activity. It is likely that the longer that we get used to um, video conferencing and the longer that we get used to uh, virtual inter interactions with our doctors 
longer we get used to um, virtual distance learning, although there's there debates over how well that's working, um, that that will take up a, a somewhat larger share of economic activity uh, in the future. And that then inevitably displaces some of the physical production or physical uh, goods and services that had been more dominant before. Okay, so um, good, good thoughts on that one. Um, let me, get, let me uh, ask for your thoughts on yet another question that came in. Uh, and that is uh, that you mentioned um, the states have a lot of pressure right now on state um, Medicaid. Um, you know, couple up with that, the response to COVID-19 and all the purchasing of supplies uh, and getting ready. Uh, and then it, that layered on on the legacy debt overhang, it gets to be pretty um, significant in terms of wreaking havoc on states' budgets. So. Um, do you think that we're going to see uh, federal financial support happening in some of the upcoming stimulus or crisis response measures? I think it's going to have to. So, uh, and this comes back a little bit to the backlash point that I was talking about earlier. So let me unpack this a little bit. Now, obviously in Illinois, uh, this is a particularly uh, uh, important question. So Illinois is actually interesting because uh, there, are, there are a few um, uh, advantages for Illinois, for example, your population 55 and above uh, is slightly below the, the, I think you've got about 27 or 28% of the population in that age category, um, uh, which is lower than the uh, national average. So that's a positive. Um, the share of state revenue that comes from the sales tax is a bit lower than uh, the national average. That's probably a positive. On the other hand, you've got effectively no rainy day fund and you've got underlying uh, pension and other uh, challenges. And you've got lots of governance questions about the split of responsibilities within um, the state and uh, with the city of Chicago and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you put all of that together and Illinois is an interesting example in which um, you, put, you layer a big new shock on top of all of that. Uh, and even if uh, there are some advantages like uh, the ones I mentioned before in terms of a slightly younger uh, population. They're not big enough to escape uh, an overwhelming problem that, that results, especially given that there was a pre-existing challenge um, for the state. And that's not, I mean, while the states uh, vary in their preparedness uh, in terms of their rainy day funds and, and what have you, I think a reasonable estimate is we're talking about several hundred, maybe even six or $700 billion in um, the hole that is created uh, for states because of the loss of revenue and the increase in especially Medicaid expenditures. And one other factor that I'd note that um, hasn't really been a feature of previous downturns is if you think about the two biggest uh, items in state budgets, it's healthcare and education, especially higher education. Mm -hmm. um, if public universities don't open in September and tuition payment or August and tuition payments are not forthcoming and state governments then have to step in to make up the difference for their public universities. That's an additional layer of fiscal drain that has not really been present during previous economic um, downturns. So you put that all together and I don't see an alternative to the federal government stepping in to provide some assistance to uh, state and local governments maybe not quite at the level that uh, speak, uh, uh, Ms. Pelosi has suggested at a trillion dollars, but at some pretty significant level. Um, and this, is, this comes back to this point about the backlash from the CARES Act that we'll be building along with growing polarization. So we just lived through this remarkable period of a very temporary partisan armistice in which the two parties came together to pass a big piece of legislation very quickly but you're already seeing the fraying of that um, as different approaches are debated, as different states adopt uh, diff different approaches to undoing social distancing, and as we approach a presidential election. And state fiscal relief is going to be front and center in, um, in that debate because roughly speaking, in Washington, there's a lot more support for state fiscal relief among Democrats than among Republicans, but even for uh, Republicans in the Senate and the House, it's complicated because many Republican governors also support uh, relief from the federal government because they don't really see an alternative. So this is one of the debates that's gonna be 
um, rocketing through the newspapers and throughout Washington and the entire country over the summer. Yeah, I think the, the political side of it um, that's coming through in these questions as well, because uh, uh, as you mentioned, there's um, varying decisions um, by the governors about whether they um, have the lockdown free now, especially on May 1st, which several of them are, are, are changing the, the requirements. Uh, and the question that came in is how much of this is being driven by um, trying to influence November elections uh, as opposed to, you know, could we truly be developing a herd uh, immunity? So um, you touched on a little bit earlier, but maybe you might want to- Well, give the only thing I'd say about that is anyone who wants to undo social distancing in the hope that that will then spur economic activity and thereby alter the political uh, outcome in November, I think is missing two points. Um, the, the first point is if you do that prematurely and, uh, and it doesn't work, which is very likely that if, again, you go too soon, people won't feel confident to fully go back to work, to fully go back to spending and what have you, then all you've really done is created another difficulty for you in an election, uh, which is that you've created more of a public health problem and you have likely created a very short, very, very short term kind of little um, sugar high for the economy, but then very quickly another problem and probably before November. So uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, so that would be, it won't work. And the second thing would be, uh, I know it's naive, but let's hope people are not thinking about things that way. We are talking about lives and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, millions of human lives uh, that are uh, affected one way or another. So it is really important for us to be able to be able to get back to the office and get back to um, sort of work, even though many people are working from home as rapidly as possible. But as Einstein once put it as, you know, as simple as possible, but not more so. So as rapidly as possible, but not more so. And the key thing again is, uh, not to do that before you've got sufficient testing in place and hopefully some kind of therapeutic or antiviral to help catch to or help mitigate the consequences for people who do get the disease. And then finally, sufficient ventilators, protective equipment, uh, et cetera, to be able to deal with people for whom any therapeutic or antiviral um, doesn't work. And in all three areas we've got, we, we still have challenges. So well-known questions about limits on uh, testing capacity and questions about the quality of the antibody testing. So we haven't talked about testing, we could get to that, but questions in that category. Um, the, we touched a little bit about, upon the antivirals and the therapeutics, but just to kind of drill on that for a second, we are getting different responses or different readouts of the Gilead drug in particular, which is the mm -hmm. most promising first one. It does look like it provides some benefit, but I think people need to kind of appreciate what that means. So in for the severely affected um, cases, which is where the more promising results uh, came out, it reduced the mortality rate. And again, this is not on average, this is for severely affected people from 11.6% to 8%. So that's great. I mean, that's a big change, but I don't think moving from 11.6 to 8% changes the psychology in any big way. It's good, but it's not like, oh my goodness, I don't really worry if this kind of goes off uh, the tracks. The other thing that people need to realize about that particular drug, although again, there is promise, is that it's uh, administered intravenously, which means you have to basically go to a medical professional mm -hmm. to have it administered. You're not mm -hmm. popping a pill to take it. It also looks like to be maximally effective, it has to be administered pretty early. So all of those are challenges for the thought that sort of, okay, we had one round and even if it comes back, we'll be able to deal with it. When it comes back under current conditions, and I said when, not if, but when it comes back under current conditions, we still are not where we would need to be to avoid another round of broad social distancing. So um, so that being said, then the questions are coming in, is there any other way to get back to normal, I guess is the, the word here, um, absent a vaccine, and then what's the, what's the path for a vaccine? Okay, so quickly on the vaccine, um, a couple points that might be worth noting. One is there is remarkable collaboration across biopharma. 
uh, to produce a vaccine as rapidly as possible. But that's relative to a world in which vaccines normally take years and years and years to come into production. I think the other thing that we need to realize about a vaccine is I think Americans are just assuming vaccine comes along and like we're we're front of the line. I remember a, a movie that my kids like where I forgot what the movie was, but there was like some long passport line and the American just said, American, American, like, you know, walking to the front of the line. Uh, and that may not be what happens here. So if the vaccine, for example, the most promising one so far is uh, from Oxford, I mean, there are lots of them, but let's just hypothetically say that it is a, uh, it is not an American um, vaccine that is first uh, produced or first uh, approved. Um, what happens? Does the UK government or government in Europe or elsewhere say, well, that's nice, but we're going to vaccinate our entire population before anyone else gets it. So I'm sorry, Americans, but you need to wait. And then on the flip side of that, so on the other side of that, so that's like we wouldn't have enough vaccine available to us. The flip side of that is we've had this whole anti-vaxxer movement in the, you know, in parts of across parts of the United States and different parts of the world. So in order for a vaccine to work from a population perspective, you need enough people to have um, been vaccinated to ch achieve the herd immunity. Um, depending on the, how much backlash there is around the vaccine, that may or may not happen. So we have not really engaged with the debate over whether we would mandate the vaccine or would it be uh, voluntary. And you can easily see all the rumors starting to, to, to fly around, you know, I apparently one that's uh, already circulating is that Bill Gates invented this disease so that he can make a lot of money off of a vaccine. You can see the kind of uh, contorted um, perspectives that may become um, prevalent even around um, a vaccine. Then quickly on the other part of the question, which is what do we do in the meanwhile? Mm -hmm. I think this is where we, where uh, more aggressive testing, which might be feasible, where it would really help. Um, because what it would allow us to do is, for example, assume that we had an ant a better antibody test that not only told you whether you had the antibodies, but also had much lower levels of false negatives than, than many of the current tests do, um, so that you could be more certain that um, if the test came back negative, that meant you didn't have the antibodies and needed to be careful um, than many of the tests today. Um, it allows you to start going back to different types of interactions um, more fulsomely uh, because you have different levels of kind of protection. Uh, and again, that one caveat to that is that is assuming that um, uh, you are, once you're immune, um, you're immune. And there's at least a question as to whether that will prove to be the case. But if, if that's not, then we have to, we, there's a whole other series of questions that arise. So let's just, for the sake of being uh, hopeful here, assume that to be the case. I think there's a lot that you could do with more aggressive testing to get people back to work sooner, um, even in the absence of an antiviral therapeutic. And the final thing I'd say is I am uh, personally, at least, uh, confused by many of the approaches that are out there. So for example, in China, um, while there is some testing, there's also very widespread uh, use of thermometers. And even here, I noticed our local Whole Foods um, test people's temperature uh, uh, occasionally or all the time um, upon entry. I don't personally know what that tells you because a very large share of people who have COVID-19 are asymptomatic and therefore don't have a fever. And a very large share of people who have a fever don't have COVID-19. So whether you have a fever or not is interesting, but it's it's a very, very bad signal with regard to filtering people who might be at risk or not. And that seems to be one that, you know, is being used very extensively. Yeah, I'm gonna be mindful of your time here. So I'm gonna ask one final question. Okay. And that is, how are you personally coping? And what gives you reason to hope? So let me uh, answer the second question first, which is uh, the reason for hope here is I remain um, impressed by how resilient people are, that how adaptable people are to challenging situations, and also inspired by how much medical innovation uh, could occur here. We are in one of these moments where um, we are, you know, never has so much been owed by so many to so few kind of moment where the world hangs on 
a relatively small band of medical researchers to come through, but I am, uh, I am hopeful and uh, looking forward to uh, their progress because I believe that um, that will happen. And then with regard to, uh, to how uh, we're coping, we're in uh, Manhattan. Um, the kids have kind of gotten used to, uh, to distance learning. It's an interesting thing to see a three-year-old uh, navigate Zoom as an expert, um, but that is, that is happening. And uh, everybody luckily in our immediate circle is happy and healthy. Good, I'm very glad to hear that. Well, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your insightful and informative discussion um, and for taking the time uh, to be with us today, Peter. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, Pete, for, on behalf of the Economic Club, um, thanks for bringing us this great opportunity. We could have listened for a lot longer. That hour just flew on by. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, recording this program will be available on YouTube channel shortly, and feel free to share that video with your networks and, uh, and colleagues. Uh, to our members, uh, we are always interested in your feedback, and we will be sending a survey after this program. Uh, and finally, to all, please stay safe, and remember that we can each do our part, as you heard very clearly today, to help out our healthcare professionals, first-line responders, and all those who are working on the front lines on our behalf uh, in this pandemic. So again, thank you very much, gentlemen. I really appreciate you being here. Today. Thank you. Thanks, have a great day.